Alright my darlings, well with the last two videos being on stuff that I wouldn't normally cover, it's time to get back to some more terrestrial fare. And what better way to do that than with a review of one of the worst movies I've ever seen based off of one of my favourite TV shows, that being Guest House Paradiso. <laughs> One of the worst movies you've seen? Surely you've seen worse than this. Well, yes I have, but that's a video for another day. But, as per usual, it's time to go into the history. Let me just say this plainly and for the record. I love Bottom. I bet you do. Not that sort of Bottom, you filth wizard. It's one of my all-time favourite shows, as you can probably tell with the abundance of clips I've used in my reviews over the years. But I'm sure many of you aren't aware of the show, and if you are... You're completely insane! But I'll give you the lowdown anyway for all of you non-sad wankers out there. Bottom is the brainchild of Rick Mail and Adrian Edmondson, a comedic double act who met in Manchester University and got their start in an underground comedy club called The Comedy store, which is what can be considered the British equivalent of The Groundlings, which is where a lot of Saturday Night Live alumni got their start. And much like The Groundlings, the Comedy Store was the launching pad for various comedians that would be pivotal in shaping the British comedy scene for the next decade, such as Jennifer Saunders, Dawn French, Nigel Planer, Alexi Sile, and Ben Elton, all of whom would be major influences on shaping how the adult comedy circuit in the UK within the 80s was formed, and the apex of this evolution started with the cult phenomenon known as the Young Ones. Once in every lifetime, come to love like this. Oh, I need you, you need me. Oh, my darling, can't you see Young Ones? Which is only natural because a lot of its creators had only just finished experiencing what university life was like a few years prior. The show starred Rick, Aid, Nigel and Alexi, alongside Christopher Ryan, in a very OTT pastiche of university student life and was written by Ben Elton. Despite how big of a cult hit it was, Young Ones has not aged particularly well. It's a bit too surreal, a lot of the jokes aren't great, and the actors hadn't quite perfected their talents as comedic players just yet. It's still a fun show, and in all honesty, Rick's character as an uber PC, pseudo-rebellious, childish, thin-skinned fuckwit is something that has aged tremendously well with the world we're in now. Neil, are these lentils South African? You bastard! You completed that! Had he still been around now, he could have easily become a writer for Vice. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. After the show went on for two seasons, Aid, Rick, Ben and Nigel would reunite for a follow-up show called Filthy Rich and Cat Flap, which, like the young ones, was reflective of how the trio's life was like at that point, as it was all about being in show business. Sadly, this one was not a big hit, only lasting a single season, and Ben Elton then left the gang to hang out with some more toffs and goffs that he began to mingle with, and went off more in his own direction. Said direction eventually culminating in him becoming an unfunny stand-up comedian. Stop laughing! Imagine you're watching Ben Helton or something! What? Rick and Aid were not done yet, decided to start writing their own scripts, and decided to use some characters that they had perfected over a decade's worth of experimentation, they made Bottom. Again semi-reflective of their lives at that point, as it's about what happens when you start to reach your middle age. But with a bit more of a dramatic license, as it's set in a grimy, low economy flat in Hammersmith, with two pathetic, low down DOS bags, both of which have hit their rock bottom, hence the name. Oh, it's no good. I think I've reached my bottom. The show, while not as big of a hit at the time as The Young Ones was, was very popular at the time, but unlike The Young Ones, it has a fan base that just keeps growing over the years, to the point where it's huge now, and that does include me in there. The show is basically their take on the traditional odd couple style dynamic, or perhaps rising damp for the UK audiences. Uh but instead of passive aggressiveness and nagging, it's concussions and testicular assault. Merry Christmas! Now that was a particularly nasty fall. A dynamic that I'm glad that we don't employ, Huck. All the best, I'd say. 
I mean, I have no intention of going near your genitals. Hurrah for that. Richie, played by Rick, is the mother-like figure, being the one who is in charge of the flat and responsible for keeping Eddie alive through his rampant hedonism, though he's by no means stable, being borderline psychotic, overly controlling, ridiculously narcissistic, and incredibly out of touch with society. Ten years I was fighting in the Falklands! Ten long years! He's totally pathetic and not sympathetic at all, but in a bizarre way, he's actually kind of relatable, sort of representing a state that we can all potentially become in life, and almost serves as a warning of what can happen if you don't keep your life on track. But Eddie, at the same time, represents the fun side of having your life go off the rails. Eddie is Richie's best, and only, friend, despite the fact that the two make it clear that they don't like each other very much. I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! Go away and crawl away and die in a ditch somewhere, you bastard! And Eddie's loathing of Richie is never really that subtle, but he knows that he needs Richie because he hasn't got anywhere else to go. I'm sorry, Richie. You're the tops. Let's have another cup of that delicious elm tea. Oh, well, it's either that or nasty, Linda. And he needs someone to help him through his life due to his alcoholism. Which is probably a contender for being the worst alcohol dependency anywhere in fictional history. This guy could drink Rick Sanchez, Homer Simpson, and Father Jack Hackett under the table. What's in this? Brandy. Meths. Perno, paint stripper, Mr. Sheen, brake fluid, and dram buoy. This setup, of course, leads to many insane scenarios, with the pair getting into trouble, making a continuous string of knob gags, and, of course, beating each other senseless. <laughs> Slapstick at its finest. Despite the abuse they go through, and even getting killed in some episodes, the pair are always ready to return for more abuse, making this show one of the closest things to a real-life cartoon that you could get. Which, with the almost non-existent budget that this show got assigned to it, that's really impressive. The show lasted three seasons, with a fourth planned but never materialised. But the pair weren't done yet, as they hit the stage with five live shows running from 1995 to 2003, all lasting around an hour and 45 minutes. Which, given how, if you watch the bloopers of the TV series, how much these guys would mess up their lines if they were longer than 15 words. Well, we're having an evening of culture and poetry and chess, you know, while you're sitting there vegetating in front of Emmerdale Farm. What's happened, by the way? As Moss, as Moss, oh, who the fuck is Moss? <laughs> is also really rather impressive, though that doesn't mean that these shows were flawless. You know my great watch gag? Yes? I've forgotten to put my watch on. <laughs> <laughs> fuck! Shut up and watch the play, right? <laughs> you leave me alone, we're never gonna get out of South fucking Hampton. There was a little mistake there, wasn't there? <laughs> Did you spot it? In fact, the bloopers, much like Dick and Dom and the Bungalow, almost became a part of the show itself and made these shows just as, if not more entertaining than the TV series. No, nothing. Increase the voltage. <laughs> yes, by, by all means. Increase the voltage. Uh, in fact, nurse. Yes, what is that? Increase the voltage to 450 volts. even if some of the later ones did fall short a little bit. Oh, and boy, didn't the audience in the last one make that clear. Small sherry, please, barmaid. What a marvellous pair of breasts you've got. After the final live show, Rick and Aid remain close friends, but decide to work more separately from then on. And thank God the internet wasn't what it was like now back then, because there would have been so many people trying to make false drama out of the idea of them potentially splitting up. Could you imagine the outrage if I suddenly stopped being in the show? Well, I'd still be here. <laughs> yeah, have the unfunny ones still around, that'll work. Perhaps we should start a more bottom-style relationship. I'll get the cricket bat. Rick stayed true to his comedic roots, and while sadly his performance as Peeves the Poltergeist in the first Harry Potter movie now remains on the cutting room floor and is yet to be seen, he did make several appearances in other kids' media and pursued a career more in voice acting with things such as Valiant, King Arthur's Disasters, Shoebox Zoo, and finding a surprising affinity for retelling fairy tales. One particular example playing Toad of Toad Hall in an animated version of Wind in the Willows, where he actually won an Emmy for it. But he wasn't totally 
gone from our screens as he did appear in a few more Comic Strip Presents specials and playing Greg Davis's fictional dad in the series Man Down before tragically passing away from a heart attack in 2014. Aid, however, decided to go in a more different direction with his career, pursuing music and drama, in particular, medical dramas, such as Holby City, Doctors and Nurses. He even had a very memorable role as a semi-reoccurring character with cancer in the popular soap opera EastEnders. And he got to be an extra in The Last Jedi, which apparently came about because the director is a big fan of Bottom. If only Rick was still alive, I'd love to have seen them play a more violent version of C-3PO and R2-D2. Only instead of C-3PO lightly tapping R2 on the head, he stabs him with an umbrella. <laughs> But of course, they didn't quite finish with Bottom yet, as when they entered the next century, the pair had plans to make Bottom even bigger and brasher as it went on. Sadly, when they reached that point, the series seemed to run out of steam. The last truly great thing they did with the series was the third live show, Hooligans Island, which was the first Bottom experiment to experiment with placing the boys in a different environment than their flat in Hammersmith, which they clearly felt was a good way to help shake up the formula, as they did the same thing with the movie this time having them be the managers of a dodgy hotel. Oh, it's not like that's ever been done before in a British comedy, right? Now here's where the first problem with the film arises. First off, the previous effort had a location that worked and made sense. Having two morons stuck on a desert island has a lot of comedic potential, and while it has been done before, seeing a more adult and rude take on it worked really well, and they really took advantage of the location in that regard. But a hotel? Don't get me wrong, it does have a lot of potential and has also worked in the past, but one of the best things about Bottom is how the two are unrepentantly scuzzy and lack any sort of responsibility whatsoever. When you add a sense of responsibility to their characters, in this case having to run a hotel, it makes it feel very different and makes the characters feel different as well, which I'll get into later. But enough with the history, let's get into the movie itself. And I want to say this movie does have some bits that might be a bit disturbing for more sensitive viewers, so be warned as we dive in head first to Guesthouse Paradiso. So, the plot. There's a plot! Yes, full oh, fuck! Richie and Eddie have somehow become managers of a hotel somewhere right on the edge of the Isle of Wight. Perfect choice of location there. Everywhere in the Isle of Wight feels like a shitty hotel. Now, on that, I wholeheartedly agree. As you'd imagine, they're not doing too well with it, only having one regular guest who's so senile and oblivious she probably thinks the hotel is her own private manor. But they do get a few guests, such as a honeymooning couple, of which the husband is played by the great Bill Nye, and Simon Pegg in his first theatrical appearance. Frankly, I think he'd be more apt to fight zombies after staying here, at least they're slightly more accommodating than these two. I've had it checked by lawyers and it's a thoroughly watertight sea view, so don't try anything funny. I'd also love to think that this is where Simon met some of these actors and became friends with them, since both Bill Nye and Liz's actor Kate Ashfield appear in this and Shaun of the Dead. Such an odd coincidence. The movie then goes from beat to beat about the two of them trying to help keep the hotel afloat or just generally managing it whilst also trying to work out their own personal differences, which, quite frankly, they'd never really been able to fix. Maybe these two would benefit from a counsellor or something. Maybe we should too. But as you'd imagine, the hotel has a lot of problems to contend with, such as the chef abandoning the hotel and taking all the food with him, a runaway Hollywood starlet running from her abusive fiancé, and a running with a nuclear power plant that just happens to live right next door to their hotel. So on paper, this sounds like it could work as a bottom movie, so why doesn't it work? Well, like I said before, a big part is how the characters don't feel like the ones we had in the TV series. The fact that Richie and Eddie have different last names makes it seem like they're trying to make it more of its own thing. Look, Mr. Twat. It's pronounced Thwaite. Which is possibly why the bottom name wasn't attached to the title. But they clearly want to have them seem like they're the characters from the TV series. And also make it clear that this is the same world with past actors turning up in it. Which makes me think that they probably would have been better if they scrapped any connection to Bottom and just made this movie its own individual thing, because now we're constantly going to keep comparing it to the show, since we know that these are supposed to be the same characters and it's really distracting, and it would have given them more freedom to experiment and go further with the idea of this movie rather than feeling like a failed attempt to bring a great TV series to the big screen, which, let's face it, has almost never worked for British sitcoms. So, as a result, one of the major problems of this movie is how the way Richie and Eddie are portrayed. 
Eddie's an idiot, which is weird because he always seemed like the voice of reason and logic in the TV series, despite being drunk a lot, but here he seems completely inept and unable to do anything himself. Here's the order, now copy that and cook it. But it'll taste all papery. Which, to be fair, that was part of his character in the show, but he wasn't as empty-headed or useless as he is here. And as for Richie, well, he's a total asshole. Just do it, or I'll pop these, okay? No! Ah! 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 I thought you said all! Freedom of speech, Eddie. That's what we fought Hitler for. So what else is new? Okay, true, he's always been an asshole, but he always seemed like a pathetic, borderline mentally deficient, almost relatable asshole. Whereas in this movie, he's sadistic, overly aggressive, and a total bastard. Go on, drink it, you bitch! <laughs> Eddie, you get the croquet mallet, while I do a bit of preliminary bridge work. To the point where he's not even enjoyable to watch, he's just loathsome. Admittedly, this comes down to how the more cinematic elements of this movie make things that would have been funny in the TV show feel almost slightly disturbing here, and just comes off as mean-spirited. Look! Here's a pencil! The first fault is the lack of a laugh track, which, to be fair, that would have been odd for a theatrical release, but still, it's odd to see Bottom without one. But the big issue is in the overwrought cinematography. The sitcom camera setup that was in the series and stage shows gave it more of a feel of being a cartoon-style world with cartoon-style physics and logic, but as soon as you break that 180 degree rule, it makes things feel more real, which is definitely something that doesn't play to Bottom's strengths. Plus the overly tight close-ups of the injuries, the bone-crunchingly realistic sound effects. <laughs> Coupled with how loud and dire the reactions sound, the incredibly grim and ugly colour scheme, and the over-reliance on using wide-angle lenses for everything makes the whole thing a lot more real and gritty than it needs to be, and it seems less like a playful dark comedy, and more like a genuine violent domestic incident, and is just as funny as that. Especially when you don't have Jeremy Beadle commenting on it. Maybe that's what that woman from the episode Digger was doing, collecting for the victims who participated in this movie, and who also watched it. Even the music sounds really really overdone for this movie. Come on! Right now, you, off to your room and I'll be, he'll be with you in a moment. Come on, come on! I really miss AIDS jazz sax. Why couldn't we have more of that in this movie? That's not to say that there aren't any funny moments here. There are a lot of funny moments, but they're not as consistent as they were in the show. Plus, again, with the lap of a laugh track, it just makes it seem more awkward than funny, especially when Richie and Eddie are still using the same timing techniques that they would normally do in the show, which worked there because of the laugh track, but here it seems more like they're confused waiting for somebody to laugh at them. Oh no, but I gave you five years in advance last week. Oh yes, oh, silly old me. And nowhere does the darker tone and style become more of an issue than the big climax of the movie, the vomit scene. The what scene? Oh yeah, be prepared for this. This scene freaked the hell out of me when I was a kid, and I didn't get over it for the rest of the year, genuinely. So talking about this scene is going to be a bit tough, let alone watching it, but I think in this case, the actions speak louder than the words. <laughs> I think you can understand why this is something hard to shake off when you watch it when you're 13. I do want to stress that I am in no way opposed to dark comedy. Quite the opposite, I love dark comedy. It's one of the reasons I love Bottom, but I feel that there needs to be a balance in there. If you go too dark and don't have the right kind of joke to level it out, it just comes off more disturbing than it does funny. Many dark comedies have made this same mistake both before and after this movie, such as Sausage Party, Meet the Feebles, and in my opinion, even some of the more more recent Simpsons Treehouse of Horror episodes. And this is one prime example of not getting the balance right. I mean, would you expect a shot like this to be in a comedy movie? Mommy. Mommy. Ah! 
No. No, neither would I. Admittedly, a lot of these problems could be attested to Rick's lack of involvement in the pre-production. A year before the movie was released, Rick was involved in a quad bike accident that nearly gave him brain damage, so A took over writing duties, and Rick, in his probably still adult state, liked the writing so much that he handed over the directorial duties to him as well, which I think was a terrible idea. Not to say that A is a bad director, he's done some good stuff both before and since this movie, but I feel that the look and style he went for was way too much in excess. It feels like a first year film student who's just gotten his hands on a set of top notch kit and is overdoing every single shot he's doing just because he can. <laughs> Bit rich coming from you. Yes, I did that too, but at least I didn't blow three million on my art house experiments. No, uh, you just stole your relative's money instead. Shh, quiet. Also, in fairness, even if they got the series director Ed Bai back, it still may not have turned out as great, considering that he did this around the same time that Guest House came out. One thing that does surprise me about this movie, which I found out when I was promoting this review, is how much of the bottom fan base not only likes this movie, they adore adore it. And to be fair, it was the very first thing related to Bottom I ever saw, and clearly I saw something in it that made me want to keep finding out more about this franchise, regardless of how much it freaked me out as a kid. And I knew there were going to be people who did enjoy this movie, but it's like 50% of the fan base loves this movie, and 50% of it don't like it, which honestly really surprised me. And for as much as I can admit that I certainly understand why some people would like this movie, if I'm being honest, Rick and Aid have done much better stuff together. Together, especially within the bottom franchise, and I just don't think this movie's particularly very well made. So, okay, I've complained about this movie quite a bit. Is there anything I like about it? Well, the kitchen fight seems pretty good, and while feeling a little bit awkward at times, it is still very entertaining. There are some good lines in there, even if they're not performed at their best. Can I ask where your eggs come from? Hen's vaginas. He's a black belt in karate, you know! More like a pink belt in hanging about gentlemen's lavatories on Hampstead Heath. One boiled damn Phoebe. One boiled oh forget the Phoebe. Look! One boiled egg! Oh God! Now oh, come on, Richie, it's not that bad. Yes, it is. I just trapped the tip of my penis in the till drawer. Some of the guest actors are entertaining, like Bill Nye and Vanilla Fielding, but sadly Simon Pegg isn't as good as you'd expect him to be. Times are hard, and uh, this is the cheapest hotel in Britain, so we're just gonna have to make the best of it, aren't we? Come on, we're on holiday! Hooray! But this was his first theatrical film, so I think we have to give him some leeway there. Shaun of the Dead did come out a few years later, and Space came out a year after this movie was released, so he still had a lot of things to perfect in his performance art. So, he went from being green to red, you could say? Yes, I suppose you could say that. And even though the climax is one of the most horrific things I've ever seen in my life, I can admit the effects are actually really impressive. They just didn't work too well in trying to actually be funny. They just ended up being disturbing. Hell, even one of my favourite YouTube poop users, actually to be frank, the only YouTube poop user that I like, Joey Snowy in his adaptation of the movie more or less skipped this scene entirely, so even he couldn't make it funny. And if he couldn't make it funny, what chance do you have? How about I feed you some of the irradiated fish that caused this incident and we'll find out. I'll shut up now then. Honestly, I think some of my favourite moments of the movies are actually the smaller bits, like this part. Excuse me one moment. I love that not only because of its brilliant delivery and it's timed perfectly, but it's all the more impressive in how it was shot. See, those were real meat hooks, and in order to make sure Adrian wasn't hurt in the process, they actually shot the scene backwards, so he's actually saying that line in reverse in real time. <laughs> So the fact that his delivery was so good, it's actually pretty unbelievable. Now, there's something that inevitably always comes back to the discussion of this movie, and that's how it compares to Rick's other most infamous movie, Drop Dead Fred. Which, I will admit, it's not a very good movie, but having seen it again recently, I'll admit that it's actually better than I remember it being, and Rick's performance can be entertaining sometimes, though it is more annoying than normal. The Panthers! Oh, and since there's no Vivian or Eddie to beat the shit out of him and shut him up, or any self-depreciating gags to offset the annoyance, it really makes the movie a chore to sit through. Though I will admit that one of Rick's best performances comes from the part where he gets serious near the end of the movie, which he does amazingly well. So... Goodbye. 
which is more than can be said for any of his performances in this movie. Oh, well, he could be anywhere. After all, he's the only one who does a fucking thing around here. I'm surprised he hasn't had a nervous breakdown by now, the amount of shit he has to put up with. Admittedly, I don't know what the lowest point in Adrian's career would be to compare it to. I mean, as I said, he was in EastEnders once, but the performance he did in that was actually really good. And I know a lot of people would say, oh, it was Last Jedi, but I actually really love Last Jedi, so I can't say that either. Do you mind if I just leave now? Why? Well, I don't want to get the same amount of hate thrown at me that you will right now from saying that you like The Last Jedi. You present this show with me, so you have to face the bullshit just the same as I do. Besides, if people get angry, I'll just have you fight a monster again. People love that. Oh, God. Anyway, back to the plot. Oh, we got a plot this year, have we? When Gina, the runaway starlet's aforementioned husband, finds her at the hotel, well, he's a chauvinistic, brutish, almost pimp-like in how cruelly he treats his wife and sees her more like property rather than a person. And not property that he treats particularly well, either. This was my mother's dress, and my grandmother's dress before that! But that's okay, bring them all and fuck them too! Granted, Bottom has always had asshole characters in it, but they're more or less set pieces for the comedy, or catalysts to move the plot forward. Well, okay, with the exception of Mr. Rottweiler, but even he treated women better than this guy does. Shut up! It's weird for Bottom to go in a South Park style of having asshole characters get their comeuppance, since our main characters are also assholes as well, so it feels a bit like a double standard here. Still, it is satisfying to see him get his karmic retribution, though in doing so, this leaves the most disturbing shot in the whole movie. <laughs> Shit, this is supposed to be a comedy? I've seen horror movies less disturbing than this. When do you watch horror movies? I use your Shudder membership. After the big fallout, quite literally in this case because it involves radiation. <laughs> A shady group of people show up and say that they'll give the pair a lot of money and a one-way ticket to paradise if they keep quiet about this. The two of them, and Gina, agree to this, and in a quick post credit scene we see the two of them finally enjoying the life that they always dreamed of. Birds, booze, breasts, busfuls of dusky young maidens, fulfilling every sordid whim, and a slap up grill for two. Well it is kind of nice to finally see the boys getting the life that they always dreamed of, but it's a shame they had to commit mass poisoning in order to make it happen. But hey, it gives us a happy ending. Overall, I can admit that I can admire some of the elements within this movie, such as its ambition, its effects, and the fact that it wasn't just a carbon copy of the TV show on a higher budget. But still, it's not a good movie. And it's kind of a shame that this is basically the swan song for the bottom franchise. There were two more live shows after this, but this does seem like it was made to be the final note in the duo story. And while the happily ever after is nice, all the stuff that was leading up to it within the movie is is rather grim and disturbing, so it makes it all rather disappointing. But hey, a good double act can save even the worst comedy. Isn't that right, Huck? Huck? I will finally get my revenge! Oh, well, uh, seems like I better get out of here and hide in the bath. Bye! Yeah!